Good morning, boys of New Hope Church. I hope this message finds you all well. I hope you all had a great day and a great week. We're going to pick up our conversation here in the book of Isaiah. Today we're in chapters 30 and 31. Last week we talked about chapter 29. We spent a lot of time discussing God's charge against Jerusalem, that their hearts were far away from the Lord. And we were recognized that God's desire was for that to change, and that his actions and his word allowed for that to happen in our lives. We ended with the idea last week that because God is for us and because Jesus came and did what he did on the cross for us, that God is worthy of praise. And now in these chapters, God is warning his people against an alliance with Egypt. Um, and I think we can agree Israel has a long-standing relationship, um, not necessarily a relationship per se, but a long-standing interaction with Egypt, even before the Exodus. You think of uh, Sarah and Abraham visiting Egypt and telling the Egyptians that Sarah is his sister back in Genesis chapter 19. Um, and so they've been friendly, they've been adversarial in the past. Isaiah, Isaiah even prophesied against Egypt back in chapter 19 when he was talking about Egypt and Cush. And, and so now it appears that Jerusalem has a problem. If you look at 2 Kings chapters 18 and 19, it speaks of the Syrian siege against Hezekiah, king of Judah. And how initially Hezekiah tried to bribe his way or to pay a um, fee, basically, to avoid this this siege upon Jerusalem. And when that didn't work, Isaiah showed up and told Hezekiah that, look, basically, Israel will be taken care of by the Lord. Don't you worry about it. Now, now that's the short version of those two chapters. Uh, but I think that these chapters of 30 and 31 tend to fall in that conversation between Hezekiah and Isaiah even though Hezekiah is not specifically mentioned here in these chapters. That's kind of my own study where I've kind of come to that conclusion that it's in that time frame that Hezekiah is talking to King, or Hezekiah is talking to Isaiah about the Syrian siege upon Jerusalem. So that's kind of where we are, where we are with chapter 30 here. Let's begin, let's read verses 1 through 7 to get started here of chapter 30. It says, Woe to the obstinate children, declares the Lord. To those that carry out plans that are not mine, forming an alliance, but not by my spirit, heaping sin upon sin, who go down to Egypt without consulting me, who look to help to Pharaoh's protection, to Egypt's shade for refuge. But Pharaoh's protection will be your shame. Egypt's shade will bring you disgrace. Though they have officials in Zion, their envoys have arrived in Hanes. Everyone will be put to shame because of a people useless to them, who bring neither help nor advantage, but only shame and disgrace. An oracle, an oracle concerning the animals of the Negev, though a land of hardship and distress, of lions and lionesses, of adders and darting snakes, the envoys carry their riches on donkeys' backs, the treasures on the humps of camels, to that unprofitable nation, nation, to Egypt, whose help is utterly useless. Therefore, I call her Rabbi, the do nothing. I'm going to stop there for a minute. So here Jerusalem is obviously troubled. And they're seeking military help from Egypt. And so on the surface, that can seem okay. So we should probably ask the question, why does the Lord cry woe towards this action, towards this alliance between Judah and Egypt? And I would argue there's perhaps two reasons for this. First, that Egypt, as we talked about, has a long history of interacting with Israel, and not always for her benefit. Israel has not always been the benefactors of Egypt. Um, where Egypt's not always been the benefactors of Israel. You think of the time they spent in the captivity, those 400 years before Moses. Egypt has not always been friendly towards Jerusalem. And I think the second but more likely reason for this is that by creating this alliance, they're not placing their trust in the Lord for his help. You know, as we'll read, they depend upon the chariots of Egypt, the manpower of the Egyptian army to defeat the Assyrians. And as we read about in chapter 19, there's always a bigger fish in the sea. Someone's always bigger and better than the Egyptians. And so the people here are putting their trust in a foreign nation for the help and support, forgetting what God can do. And so their fear of what Assyria, what Assyria can do is much greater than their fear of the Lord. And so I think that's where that woe comes from. When they start putting somebody else is greater than God, the Lord says, woe to you for doing that. Woe to you for trusting in somebody greater than me for your deliverance. And the Lord himself is the deliverance of Israel. And so that's where that woe comes from. But let's keep going here. Let's read verses 8 to 17 here. Read a little more about uh, the heart of the people that Isaiah is describing. 
says, Go now, write on a tablet for them, inscribe on them in a scroll. For the days that to come, it may be an everlasting witness. These are rebellious people, deceitful children, children unwilling to listen to the Lord's instructions. They say to the seers, See no more visions, and the prophets, Give us no more visions of what is right. Tell us the pleasant things, prophesy illusions. Leave us this way. I'm sorry, leave this way, get off this path, and stop comforting us, the Holy One of Israel. Therefore, this is what the Holy One of Israel says. Because you have rejected this message, relied on oppression, and depended upon deceit, and this sin will become for you like a high wall, cracked and bulging, that collapses suddenly in an instant. It will break in pieces like pottery, shattered so mercilessly that among the pieces not a fragment will be found for taking coals from the hearth or scooping water out of a cistern. This is what the Sovereign Lord says, the Holy One of Israel says, In repentance and rest is your salvation, in quietness and trust is your strength, but you would have none of it. He said, No, we are to flee on horses, therefore you will flee. You have said we will ride off on swift horses, therefore your pursuers will be swift. A thousand will flee at the threat of one, and at the threat of five you will all flee away, till you are left like a flagship on a mountaintop, it's like a flagstaff on a mountaintop, like a banner on a hill. And so here we have God describing the heart of the people. And the people want a comfort over the truth. And I think in some ways I understand that. They saw this army coming and they wanted to flee. They wanted to get out of town. They didn't want Isaiah's words of judgment for the people. They wanted to have a nice story with a happy ending that was in their favor. And so when I first read this message, I thought of the passage in 2 Timothy 4, uh, where it talks about the believers wanting, in the latter days believers will want their ears tickled instead of the truth. And I think we don't always want to hear the truth. We often want to do things our own way for our own benefit. But the truth says, no, you can't do it that way. You can't do it your way. And I think about what Jesus said about the truth in John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. And again, in John eight thirty two, he said, the truth will set you free. And he was praying for believers, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. You know, and so, as we talk about this thing, mankind doesn't always want to hear the truth. They want to be comfortable. They want to be cozy. They don't want to be in conflict or in strife. Their desires for a safe and insulated world. Yet when they choose the truth over the lie, there are consequences. When people choose deceit over honesty, there's an action or there's a consequence for that. And so here the people don't want to accept that fact. Their only desire is to be safe and secure and comfortable and they want to trust in what they can see as opposed to the Lord whom they can't. So they don't want to trust in God because they can't see God. But in reality, look back over the history of Jerusalem time and time and time again. The Lord has shown up and proven his faithfulness to the people. And they're just ignoring that history and saying, no, no, we just want to be comfortable. Don't tell us prophecies that are true. Just give us illusions that we can think are true. Give us something fake that we can hold on to because that will make our hearts feel better. And so Israel really has a problem, and Jerusalem really has a problem of sin, in that their hearts are that far removed from God. That they can't understand and can't distinguish between the truth and the lie, or worse, they distinguish it, they just choose the lie. That's Israel's problem. That's Jerusalem's problem right now. Let's keep going. Let's go verses 18 to 26. It says this. It says, Yet the Lord longs to be gracious to you, he rises to show you compassion, for the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all who wait for him. All people of Zion who live in Jerusalem, you who weep no more, you will weep no more. How gracious he will be when, he, when you cry for help. As soon as he hears, he will answer you. While the Lord gives you the bread of adversary, adversity and the water of affliction, your teachers will be hidden no more. With your own eyes, they will see them. Whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, Walk in the way, walk in it. Then you will defy your idols, overlaid with silver, and your images covered with gold. You will throw them away like a minstrel cloth, and say to them, Away with you. He will send you rain for the ground, and seed you sow, and the food that comes from the land will be rich and plentiful. And that day your cattle will graze in broad meadows, the oxen and donkey that work the soil will eat fodder and mash, spread out with fork and shovel. In the day of great slaughter, when the towers fall, streams of water will flow on every high mountain and every lofty hill. 
The moon will shine like the sun, and the sunlight light seven times brighter, like the light of seven full days, when the Lord binds up the bruises of the people and heals the wound he inflicted. You understand what he's telling his people here in these verses, in verses 18 to 26? He's telling the people the result of trusting God. And we've established that it's not their first instinct, but he says that those who trust will receive God's blessing. They're instructed in the ways of the Lord, and they're blessed to be by his presence. And what's more, that's God's desire for us. In verse 18, it says, The Lord longs to be gracious to you. The Lord longs to be gracious to you. What an amazing statement. God's desire is for us. His desire is to bless us and help us know him better. He wants us to prosper and thrive as a people, to be an example to others about the love of God. And we accept God's judgment. And we understand that it's for our benefit. He is gracious enough, kind enough, and loving enough to heal any wounds afflicted by that judgment. That's in verse 26. Isn't that amazing that God longs to be gracious to you so much so that whatever causes you to have that turnaround, whatever judgment comes upon you, he's going to heal those wounds as well. Because he longs to be gracious to us. That's an amazing picture of God's love to us. Let's close out this chapter in verses 27 to 33. It says, See, the name of the Lord comes from afar with burning anger and dense clouds of smoke. His lips are full of wrath. His tongue is a consuming fire. His breath is like a rushing torrent rising up to the neck. He shakes the nations in the sea of destruction. He places the jaws in the jaws of the people and leads them a, a bit that leads them astray. And you will sing on that night as you celebrate a holy festival your hearts will rejoice when the people go up with flutes to the mountain of the Lord, to the rock of Israel. The Lord will cause men to hear his majestic voice, will make them see his arms come down with raging anger and consuming fire, with cloudburst, thunderstorm, and hail. The voice of the Lord will shatter Assyria. With his scepter he will strike them down. Every stroke the Lord lays on them will be his punishing rod. And to them will be music of tambourines and harps as he fights them in the battle with the blows of his arm. Topheth has long been prepared. It has been made ready for the king. Its fire has been made wide and deep in the abundance of fire and wood. The breath of the Lord, like streams of burning sulfur, will set it ablaze. You know, look at that image of God's judgment here. He is, is consuming fire. You know, if you read in 2 Kings 19, it talks about how an Assyria woke up one morning and 185,000 of the men were dead in camp. And that's what broke the siege of Jerusalem. The judgment of God is significant. It's powerful. And God has a jealous love for his people. His desire is for us. And we need to give reverence to that fact. And we just read about God's longing for us and his desire is for our good. And now we see his judgment upon the enemies of Israel. And in short, it's just not a good idea to set yourself up against the Lord or against his people. God's judgment will be severe and it will be harsh. But for the believer, his judgment is always for our benefit. So let's read chapter 31 here. Let's finish out this, this passage here, this time of um, Egypt and Assyria and Jerusalem. Let's read out, finish out that passage here. It says this in chapter 31. It says, Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help who rely on horses, who trust in the multitude of their chariots, in the great strength of the horsemen, but do not look to the Holy One of Israel or seek help from the Lord. Yet he is too wise and can bring disaster. He does not take back his words. He will rise up against the house of the wicked, against those who help evildoers. But the Egyptians are men and not God. The horses are flesh and not spirit. When the Lord stretched out his hand, he helps. He who helps will stumble. He who is helped will fall, but both will perish together. This is what the Lord says to me, as a lion growls, a great lion over his prey, as though a whole band of shepherds is called together against him. He is not frightened by their shouts or disturbed by their clamor. So the Lord Almighty will come down and do battle on Mount Zion and on its heights. Like the birds hovering overhead, the Lord Almighty will shield Jerusalem. He will shield it and deliver it. He will pass over it and rescue it. Return to him. You have so greatly revolted against him. O Israel, from that day, every one of you reject the idols of silver and gold your sinful hands have made. 
Assyria will fall by the sword that is not of man. The sword, not of mortals, will devour them. They will flee before the sword, and the young men will be put into forced labor. The stronghold will fall because of terror at the sight of battle. At the sight of the battle stand of their commanders will panic, declares the Lord, whose fire is in Zion, whose furnace is in Jerusalem. So here in chapter 31, we really kind of have the summation of uh, chapter 30 and 31 here. And God gives two warnings. First, he again warns against that alliance with Egypt. And secondly, he tells of the coming judgment upon Assyria. But the part I want to focus on is the alliance with Egypt. And so this is the second time in this passage God has mentioned this proposed alliance. The people, when there's what seems to be facing them is insurmountable, and they're challenged, they're, they're turned back to people oppressed, for, I'm sorry, these people who face an insurmountable challenge, their desires, and turn back to another nation that's oppressed them for centuries. That doesn't make a lot of sense to me. They've got one battle over here, and to fight that battle, they're going to go against, or go and get a, an alliance with the people that's already oppressed them once. So they're really not making a lot of progress. But as I thought about that this week, I thought, how do I respond when I'm confronted with a worldly challenge? Do I immediately trust in God, or do I return to Egypt? And what do I mean by that? I mean, there's things that we all experience in life, habits, places, attitudes, actions that would comfort us before we found Christ. I, ideas or thoughts, behaviors that we turn to when we try to cope with this world. And so when we have this challenge the Lord places before us, is our instinct to turn to those things that we used to do, or is our instinct to turn to the Lord himself? And it could be an avoidance of the world, it could be physical comfort, it could be a defensive attitude that we all had. But remember what Jesus said. He wants to give us the truth. And we know that in the truth of God, in the truth of Jesus, there is freedom and there is the fear of the Lord. But it's a fear of God, not of man. It's a comfort to be found in that fear that he is greater than whatever else might be found on this earth. And so when we have those times when we're confronted with this world, do we return to our Egypts or do we return to the Lord? And, and I don't know what that Egypt is for you, uh, but I know that God is greater than whatever that might be. God's desire is for us, period. His desire is for us, period. He longs to be gracious to us. That through that blessing, that that will lead to our, not only to our comfort, but it will be lead to our good. And, and that blessing may not be comfortable. It might be something better prepared for the future for us. But we have to be okay with that fact that God's blessing may not mean may not be the same as our comfort. Because at the end of the day, the truth is always better than a lie. And God is always better than anything in this world. So I don't know what Egypt is that you might be tempted to turn back to when life gets hard. But I just want to encourage you today to turn to the Lord. He longs to be gracious to us. Jesus, we thank you for today and this time together. Lord, be with us this week as we go. Lord, let us be a people that trusts in you. And may our hearts be in line with your heart. And Lord, let that lead to such a radical transformation in our lives that people long to see you and know you because they see the impact you've had in us, Lord. So Father, we thank you for today. Lord, when those hard time comes, help us to trust in you. Help us to trust in you. For your truth, Lord, is always better than the lie of this world. Father, we love you. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as always, thanks for joining me. I'm so glad you did. Uh, next week, we'll do chapter 32. But until then, remember that God loves you and we're a blessed people.